If it's Tuesday, it's the trail versus the trial. President Biden hitting the road, pitching voters in battleground Pennsylvania on his economic agenda while the former president, President Trump, sits in a criminal courtroom as the first jurors in that hush money trial have just been selected and sworn in. Plus, Speaker Johnson in jeopardy, a second House Republican, is now threatening to oust Johnson from leadership amid an escalating fight to get foreign aid to Ukraine and Israel through an unruly Republican conference. And the January 6th attack front and center at the Supreme Court as it hears a case that could impact former President Trump and hundreds of defendants who allegedly participated in the attack. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Peter Alexander here in Washington on a day in which the state of play for the 2024 election really is on full display. President Biden is on the campaign trail. Former President Trump is in the courtroom as they are both locked in this highly competitive race for the White House. There have been some new developments in just the past few moments in that Manhattan courtroom where it is day two of jury selection in Mr. Trump's hush money trial. In just the last few moments, six jurors have been selected. They have been sworn in. In all, as we've told you, 12 jurors and six alternates are going to be needed to be chosen so that this trial can get going. All day long, lawyers have been questioning prospective jurors about whether they can fairly judge Donald Trump while Mr. Trump in the courtroom looks on. This, of course, is the first of four criminal cases facing the former president. The Supreme Court is going to hear arguments next week on Mr. Trump's claims of immunity tied to his election interference case. And heading into court today, the president, the former president, we should say, again pushed baseless claims that these cases are part of a conspiracy, as he describes it, to keep him out of the White House. I should be right now in Pennsylvania, in Florida, in many other states, North Carolina, Georgia, campaigning. This is all coming from the Biden White House. They're using this in order to try and win an election. Of course, in each of these cases, a grand jury ultimately is what moved the case forward. President Biden, meanwhile, is in Pennsylvania right now, stumping in his hometown of Scranton, where he is pitching voters on his economic plan and how it contrasts with Mr. Trump's. He criticized Trump for cutting taxes for the rich, for his handling of the pandemic, and for the number of jobs lost during the Trump presidency. The president also issued this warning about a potential second Trump term. Folks, he's coming for your money, your health care, and your Social Security. And we're not going to let it happen. We're not going to, can't let it happen. That was President Biden just a short time ago. Polls show President Biden has work to do when it comes to convincing Americans that his presidency has been better than his predecessors. Listen to this. A majority of Americans, 52 percent, say they are worse off financially than they were four years ago. According to a Fox News poll conducted last month, just 22 percent say they are better off. And joining us now is NBC News national correspondent Yasmin Vesugian. She is outside the Manhattan courthouse. NBC News White House correspondent Mike Mamley traveling with the president today. He is in Biden's childhood home of Scranton. Yasmin, let's get to you in that news developing as we speak. We have just learned that these six jurors have been seated. They've been sworn in. What more do we know about these? Yeah, six jurors, Peter, um, as you said. Um, we have a waiter that works in sales, an oncology nurse, an attorney, an IT consultant, a teacher, and a software engineer as well. Four men, um, two women, by the way. Let me, let me read some of the descriptions that we got for juror number one, um, along with another juror as well. A man wearing, this is juror number one, wearing a black T-shirt, carrying a black backpack as well, living in West Harlem, but originally from Ireland, Ireland working in sales. Previously worked as a waiter as well, married, um, and his spouse is in school, and they have no children. Another juror is an Asian man with black hair. He was wearing a, a, a purple jacket. He looks like he's in his late 20s or early 30s, living in Chelsea uh, for five years from Oregon as well. So this is just a glimpse, Peter, at two of the six jurors that are now seated. I do have to say this process is going a lot quicker than we had expected. We had thought it would take at least two weeks to seat an entire jury. We're, we're halfway there. 
there, right? They've got to get to 12, and then they're going to have some alternate jurors as well. They just recently brought in 96 more jurors um, into the courtroom in which Judge Juan Mershon read them some of the rules, just about five minutes or so, and then sent them off. And so they had to return Thursday morning at 9.30 a.m. sharp to get started once again. And so they'll dig into that pool starting on Thursday to come up with the next six to complete this jury, Peter. And what's sort of interesting about this, and I was just reading up about this, is there's these sort of preemptory challenges that both sides get, right? The Trump side has used six of its ten. Basically, yeah. that's sort of like blackballing someone, saying, no, we don't want that person no matter what. We don't need to hear anything else. The prosecution has used four of its ten. What were some of the challenges that the lawyers on each side were making to those prospective jurors? So much of it was actually about social media posts. And that was what was most interesting. We actually didn't get any causal challenges from the people or from the prosecution on certain jurors, but there were a lot of causal challenges from the defense on various jurors um, that they went through. There was one instance from one individual, one woman, where they talked about a Facebook post. And this kind of gives you an example of what went on in that courtroom today. Um, and from this fake Facebook post, it was a screen grab of an outdoor location. And in this post, she says, I have to get in the car and spread the honking cheers. There's an actual dance party on 96th Street. This was posted on the day it was announced that Joe Biden had won the 2020 election. So. Um, Todd Blanche, the former president's attorney, had challenged this, saying he didn't believe that she would be a fair and impartial witness. Um, there was a lot of back and forth in that moment. And what was interesting was at that point, um, Judge Juan Mershon actually admonished Donald Trump and said, essentially, while the juror was about 12 feet from your client, your client was audibly saying something in her direction. I will not have any juror intimidated in this courtroom. Take a moment to speak with your client. Wow. That all happened in the courtroom in front of this potential juror, and that was all on causal grounds. And it went on like that um, for a few hours, Peter. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yasmin Masugin with the very latest from the courthouse there in Manhattan with a lot more work to do, but they made real progress a third of the way, I guess we could say, right? Six of the 18 total, 12 jurors, six alternates. Yasmin, thank you so much. Let's get to Mike Bembley. He is in Scranton, Pennsylvania, traveling uh, with the president, who we each cover for a living. Mike, Mike I want to ask you about this. We've been watching his every move. We've been pressing his aides. Did the president make any acknowledgement of Mr. Trump's legal issues today? He's really trying to sort of hone in on this split screen. Yeah, you said it, Peter, because this is really shaping up to be a surreal week in an already unusual campaign where you have the former president in his hometown of New York facing these very serious criminal charges on trial, while the current president is in his hometown of Scranton trying to, let's say it, engage in a policy debate, talk about the economy. And it was interesting to hear the president today because, as you know well, we have seen that the campaign, we have seen that this White House in particular, is very reluctant to engage on what are the former president's multiple legal woes. There's the argument of we are, uh, as he, as the head of the Justice Department, he can't be seen as engaging in it. But they also think that that's already sort of baked in the cake for voters. And so they want to engage uh, in this policy debate. But I thought it was so striking, Peter, today, uh, according to our, our team, Elise Perlmutter Gumbiner counted the number of references specifically to Donald Trump in the president's remarks here today, 23. That's a lot more than we usually get in a presidential speech, yeah. even in a campaign speech. And so this is a moment when the campaign does, yes, they like the split screen moment. They think that it speaks for itself, that the president is here talking about what matters to voters, while Donald Trump, they argue, is focused on himself. But it was a moment for Joe Biden to sort of needle his opponent a little bit. He even made that joke he has made only in private so far about a distressed man facing mountains of debt coming up to him and see, needing some help. Biden responding to him, I can't help you, Donald. It got a big laugh in this room the first time we've seen that publicly and maybe a, a shift in, in tone and tenor here of this campaign as we go forward. Yeah, that is interesting, Mike. I want to ask you specifically to the topic. The reason for this visit was to focus heavily on the issue of the economy. He'll meet with steel workers tomorrow. Obviously, there's a big debate right now about the potential sale of um, U.S. steel to Japan, but but specific to the topic of economy broad uh, with a broad sweep here, what is the administration, what's the president trying to do to sort of flip the script on this? Because Americans widely disapprove of the president's economic record at this point, even though there are a lot of signs that the economy has been going in the right direction. Record job growth of the course of his time in office. Yeah, there's a huge gulf between the data that shows 
uh, what the Biden campaign calls the fairest and fastest economic recovery in our nation's history with what voters feel. They still, as one advisor has put it, that COVID has a long tail. And so the, the Biden team knows it has to get out and make this economic argument. Uh, and, and they're choosing this moment to do so intentionally because they think it helps speak to the larger values point. The president framing this in his speech today as I see the economy through the eyes of Scranton, where the former president sees it through Mar-a-Lago, talking about him promising tax cuts to his rich donors while he is focused on the needs of the working class, Peter. Mike Memley on the ground with the president there in Pennsylvania, where the president and I suspect Mike will be for most of the next several days. Mike, thank you so much. And joining me now for a bit more on that jury selection that is underway in former President Trump's trial is Carol Lamb, a former federal prosecutor and former state court trial judge. Fortunately for us, she is now an NBC News legal analyst. Carol, what has what you've seen of the beginning of this jury selection told you about how this process is going overall? It does seem that the selection of six jurors this quickly means they're moving with pretty good pace. They are moving quickly, Peter. And I have to say that the oddest thing to me about this is that the jury is being selected and sworn in piecemeal. That generally doesn't happen. Generally, in a, in a typical criminal case, and I understand there's virtually nothing typical about this, but mm -hmm. in a typical criminal case, you voir dire, that is, you ask questions of all the jurors, and then the parties make their selections, either they challenge for cause or they issue, or they use their peremptory strikes, which by definition means they don't have to give a reason for striking a juror. And then um, 12 people are chosen and they are all sworn in together. This throws a bit of a monkey wrench in it. They, they've seated six jurors and then they're going to take up jury selection in the coming few days to, to select the other six jurors and then six more alternates. And what that means really for both parties is they don't get the opportunity to sort of choose 12 people as a whole. They're, they're sort of doing it piecemeal. So now they've got six. Now they have to look at the next six that are coming up and they have to think, well, which of these upcoming jurors uh, will play well with the with the others or not play well with the others and and that's unusual that's that's uh, not typical for the parties can you give us a sense carol i'm sort of struck by this and i was hearing from some other jury selection analysts experts on this about what each side is looking for that like the the trump side is looking for sort of those more explosive figures those very opinionated figures who could kind of I don't know, force a hung jury, could kind of blow up the jury deliberation room. Whereas the prosecution is looking for those who are more deliberative and willing to sort of find consensus and be good team players. How do you sort of view the, the desires on each side? Sure, and the reason the prosecution is looking for good team players and people who can compromise and get along with each other, of course, is because they not only have the burden of proving their case beyond a reasonable doubt, but they have to get a unanimous jury. They, they have to get all 12 to agree. The defense doesn't bear that burden. Of course, they would love to have 12 jurors vote for acquittal. But if they can't get that, just one dissenting vote is right. enough uh, for a hung jury. So as a government prosecutor, as a state prosecutor, what you're looking for generally is somebody who, A, can make the decision to sit in judgment on another person. And and there are many people in 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 our culture and our society who don't feel comfortable with that responsibility. Yeah. You, you want to find that out. Um, generally speaking, you might, you might shy away from people in the more caring pro professions, uh, nurses, teachers, that sort of thing. But again, these are just generalities because people are very complicated and they may hold one view or live in a certain part of town or, or say something in the past that you think indicates one thing. And you would be hard pressed to find an experienced trial attorney who has not been surprised either in a good way or a bad way by the way a juror ends up voting. It's sort of the literal judge a book by its cover is the way this thing kind of plays out in such a short process. I want to ask you quickly about the, the potential for, for, for movement on the gag order. We know that Mr. Trump has been active on social media, not just over the last 24 hours, but over the last however many hours since this case first became a real thing. Could that come back to haunt him, though, next week when Judge Mershon holds a, a hearing of on potential violations of his gag order? Could he expand it, the judge? Oh, the judge can certainly expand the gag order. And now that the trial is underway, the judge is going to be paying a great deal of attention to everything that's going on, not only in the courtroom, but unfortunately in this trial outside the courtroom as well. He's got a, a sort of pending motion from the state now to find uh, former President Trump in violation of the gag order because of comments that he has made and things he has written in social media about Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels two upcoming witnesses uh, who he is prohibited from making derogatory statements about. 
Personally, I think the Michael yeah. Cohen situation is a little bit tougher because Michael Cohen has also been out there uh, making a lot of statements publicly. And I think that to be fair, the judge may have to weigh those as well. But mm. if the judge feels that uh, Donald Trump is taking swipes at uh, people, at witnesses, at you, you saw him sort of uh, react badly to the juror, uh, to, to Donald Trump making making remarks within earshot of a juror, yeah. uh, you know, he may well expand that gag order. Carol Lamb, we always appreciate your perspective and your expertise. Thanks for speaking with us here. Still ahead right now on Meet the Press. Now the House delivers articles of impeachment, putting the fate of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas in the hands of the Senate while the House Speaker fights for his own job. Plus, as President Biden makes his pitch to Pennsylvania voters, we're going to speak to the Senator John Fetterman about the Democrats' efforts to keep that Commonwealth blue in November and his foreign policy disagreements with the president. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. It is a busy day on Capitol Hill where Speaker Mike Johnson's grip on the Speaker's gavel is facing its largest test yet. The Speaker is now trying to get emergency aid to Ukraine and Israel through what is clearly a bitterly divided chamber by splitting up a foreign aid bill into four separate pieces. One for Israel, another for Ukraine, yet another for Taiwan, and finally one more that includes really a wish list of some other key Republican policy priorities. The House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Mike McCall, a fierce defender of Ukraine, gave the strategy his backing today and called for urgency from his colleagues. The world is on fire and um, history will judge us by our actions. Uh, were you Chamberlain or were you Churchill? The speaker has a plan. We're going to address Israel. We're going to address Ukraine. We're going to address Taiwan. And I want to thank the speaker for his leadership in this very, very difficult time and very dangerous time. But the time clearly to act is now. But the price of putting these bills on the floor could be Speaker Johnson's job. Kentucky's Thomas Massey became the second Republican to call for Johnson's ouster over his handling of foreign aid and other issues, saying that he told the speaker to resign during a conference meeting this morning. Here's what Johnson then told reporters after. I am not resigning, and it is, uh, it is, in my view, an absurd notion that someone would bring a vacate motion. And we are simply here trying to do our job. Um, it is not helpful to the cause. It is not helpful to the country. It has not helped the House Republicans advance our agenda, which is in the best interest of the American people here. If Johnson's detractors force a vote to oust him, the Speaker would likely have to rely on House Democrats to keep the gavel. NBC Sahil Kapoor has the very latest now from Capitol Hill for us. This is a make or break week for Speaker Johnson. Talk us through the state of play right now, Sahil. Important and a very perilous moment for Speaker Johnson. The walls are closing in on him from both the pro Ukraine and the anti Ukraine wings of his caucus. He's sort of like, uh, to use an analogy, that basketball coach who has delayed and delayed, who has exhausted all of his timeouts, and now he finally has to call the play. And this is the play he is calling four separate bills. And the purpose here is that each bill can have a unique coalition. Israel aid can pass with mostly Republicans, and a lot of progressives can vote against it. Ukraine aid can, in theory, here pass with mostly Democrats and some. Republicans like Mike McCall there can support it. Uh, and the other two bills are somewhat less controversial here. Uh, this is the decision that, that Mike Johnson has made to move forward with this, even though, it, as you know, some could have predicted, it is intensifying some of these threats to his gavel from the anti-Ukraine wing, as you just saw there, you, as you just pointed out, Tom Massey joining Marjorie Taylor Greene, saying he would co-sponsor that motion to vacate, becoming the second member of the Republican caucus to say uh, he would vote to oust Speaker Johnson. Yeah, and if he needed Democrats, obviously that would represent a very weakened speakership for Speaker Johnson. Take us inside this House Republican conference. Thomas Massey of Kentucky joining Marjorie Taylor Greene calling for the ouster of Speaker Johnson. What did you hear from him today and have any others sort of decided to get on board with this effort? Well, so far, it's just two of them. I mean, Tom Massey made this uh, somewhat surprising announcement to his colleagues by saying uh, at this conference meeting that he would join Marjorie Taylor Greene in uh, co-sponsoring that motion to vacate. She had been sort of on an island by herself for several weeks. Nobody else had poked their head out and said they would support it. And Johnson, just a few days ago, paid, you know, made that pilgrimage to Mar-a-Lago, seemed to get some support from former President Trump. But that didn't move Tom Massey. Let's take a listen to what he had to say. 
There's only one person right now who can stop us from going into what happened last fall, and that's Mike Johnson. He's cleaning the barn, that's obvious. He had three things to do. He wanted to do an omnibus that broke all the you know, spending records. Uh, he wanted to do FISA without warrants. And now he wants to do Ukraine. Those are the three things. There are people riding him like a horse here. They don't care when the horse collapses. I do, because it's gonna throw our conference into turmoil. It's, regardless of what I want, it's going to happen. And uh, when it does happen, it's going to pass. The motion to vacate will pass. Now, after those comments, I spoke separately to uh, Congressman Massey. He told me that he believes there are more than eight Republicans who will vote to oust Speaker Johnson. And he said that vote is inevitable. He used the word the number eight because that's the number that uh, former Speaker Kevin McCarthy got in terms of Republican opposition. That was enough. He said if Democrats vote to rescue uh, Johnson, that might work the first time. But he said that would only make Johnson more toxic to Republicans. And for every Democrat that Johnson wins, Massey said he would lose two to three more uh, Republicans. Uh, and so in the long term, it would not be sustainable. Finally. Peter, there was a, a, another big moment today on Capitol Hill where the articles of impeachment passed by House Republicans uh, for uh, DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas were finally delivered to the Senate. Mark Green, the uh, impeachment manager, read them out loud. Tomorrow, the jurors will be sworn in. The jurors are, of course, the senators. There are only two ways this ends, a dismissal before a trial or an acquittal after a trial. There's no way the Senate is going to find the votes to convict Alejandro Mayorkas. The question is, how quickly do they dispense with this? Sahil Kapoor doing double duty, juggling all sides of the hill for us today. Sahil, thank you. And as we mentioned, President Biden is in Battleground, Pennsylvania today, kicking off what is a three-day campaign tour in the key state. And joining me now is the Pennsylvania Democratic Senator, John Fetterman. Senator Fetterman, I appreciate your being with us. As we said, the president is in your home state, the great Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, for this several-day swing. His path to re-election is essentially non-existent without the Keystone State. What should be his pitch yeah. to build on his slim 2020 margin there? Well, well, of, well, of course. Um, uh, I've always said this for years, that Pennsylvania picks the president. And I want to point out that Joe Biden is the only American that actually beat Trump in Pennsylvania. He did that in 2020, and he's going to do that in 24. It's going to be close. I've been very clear about that. But, you know, Trump is not able to win Pennsylvania over Joe Biden. And that's why Joe Biden is vis visiting Pennsylvania and he's going to again and again and again. And he is going to make the kinds of investments to make sure that he carries the, the Keystone state. Mr. Senator, I, I want to put up some numbers for our audience from a recent New York Times Siena poll. It says that 42 percent said that Donald Trump's years in office were mostly good for America. Just 25 percent said the same of President Biden. What's your sort of take on that? How do you explain that? And how does President Biden win when more folks, at least according to this poll, think Mr. Trump did a better job? Well, I mean, I, you know, if if polls were, were right, uh, I would have uh, I would be home and you'd be talking to some weirdo from New Jersey talking about Pennsylvania and Trump's uh, opportunities again. So the poll, the polls uh, predicted that I was going to lose uh, or anything. And I'm not worried about these polls as well, too. Uh, what is going to happen is that it's going to be two very stark choices right now. And if anyone honestly looks back on what it was like four years ago, we couldn't even be doing this right now. Now, we would all on a lockdown as that as well. And we had COVID uh, tearing through our nation. And now over one million Americans were claimed by COVID. So if you really s significantly think that, that Trump was doing a better job, I, I don't believe most people are not going to do that. Yeah, it is a good reminder of where we were. If you ask how, if you were better off four years ago, four years ago, you were in lockdown at your home. In your campaign, you ran against someone who was a very well-known public figure, Dr. Oz. You still work to shape voter perceptions of him, and you did it early. What advice would you give to President Biden and his team right now to try to do the same as it relates to Mr. Trump? Well, I, I, don't, I don't offer advice for, on anything other than fashion. And uh, why would I have any kinds of advice for Joe Biden? Joe Biden already beat the brakes off of Trump in, in Pennsylvania. And then they, you know, Trump tried to claim that there was voter fraud in anything. And there was vote, uh, vote, uh, voter fraud in Pennsylvania. And that was six uh, Republicans. And they voted for Trump. Uh, they used the ballots of their dead mothers to vote for that. And they were all caught. They were all prosecuted and convicted. And now they're on probation. And now, so it's going to be a safe, secure, 
election here in Pennsylvania, just like as it always been. And uh, no matter what he says, uh, it's a fact that Joe Biden carried Pennsylvania and he's going to do that again. Senator Fetterman, with a hat tip to the black hoodie, your fashion choice for today, I do want to ask you about a more serious topic, well, of, of course. course. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do want to ask you about foreign policy, if I can. Following the Iranian attack on Israel over the mm -hmm. weekend, you told CNN that you disagreed with President Biden urging Israel not to retaliate. What do you say to national security officials who say that they are concerned that an Israeli response against Iran could provoke a larger war? Well, no. I, what, what I do, what I do believe is, is that we need to to follow Israel on that. We don't have to agree with it, but we need to stand with Israel uh, in that situation. He is our special ally, and it's the democracy there in the Middle East as well. And we can never forget that all of this, all the tragedy, the death, and the destruction, is all because of Hamas and what they've done on October 7th as well. Again, and to anybody watching, it's like in in doubt, lean on and this and decide with and standing with democracy and our key ally, Israel. But to be clear, uh, though you support standing with our key ally, Israel, doesn't the U.S. have some, some stakes here, given the fact that if this were, if Israel were to, to respond in some sort of rash way, perhaps even attacking within Iran, well, that really could spark a wider war that would draw the U.S. into it more, further? Well, I, I, I think Israel is going to respond in an appropriate way. Uh, I, I don't expect it's going to be anything drastic or anything like that. But let's really talk about that, that Iran launched, what, two to three hundred drones and other kind of missiles as well, too. And this is that, if anything, that just only underscores why we need to lean in and stand with Israel on that. It's, it's just been very clear for, for me. And it's OK if somebody disagrees with that. That's 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 reasonable. I just don't think it's really controversial to anybody to, to lean in on with, with Israel. Let me ask you if I can very quickly about some politics back in your home state. I want to ask you specifically about the divide on this issue within your party, inside your state. The Democratic Congresswoman Summer Lee is facing a primary challenge over her calls for a ceasefire in Gaza. You've endorsed her. But do you think she could lose this primary if she does not change her position on Israel? Well, uh, again, uh, of course, uh, Congresswoman Lee and I agree and intersect on some issues and we disagree on others. And, and I respect and, and I think diversity of thoughts uh, and opinions in our party is, is healthy. And I'm absolutely fine with that. She happens to be my Congresswoman uh, and, and it's really how this is going to go. I, I don't have any opinion on how the race will go, but I will say she is popular and she works hard. And I don't know how that's going to be up to the voters to decide. But let me ask that very quickly if I can follow up what makes you comfortable endorsing someone who has said that Israel is committing war crimes as she described it in Gaza well, and like I said, it's, it's thought diversity as well. I don't happen to agree with, with the president in every situation on every view, but I'm absolutely 10,000 uh, supportive of him. And let's talk about this. Let's talk about how dangerous it is to have this uncommitted or to abandon Biden kind of a thing. And I also be clear that if anyone wants to engage in that, you want to play with that kind of fire, then you really need to own the burn if that allows Joe Biden to lose and have the, the worst president of all time giving an opportunity for a second term, which is obviously very uh, committed and, and absolutely uh, obsessed with uh, revenge. Senator John Fetterman of the great Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, we appreciate your time. Thanks for speaking with us today. Okay, thank you. Coming up, Republicans versus Republicans. The panel is going to join us to talk about the infighting playing out in the House and whether Democrats should bail out Speaker Johnson. That's ahead. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. As we mentioned earlier today, Congressman Thomas Massey became the second Republican to call for Speaker Mike Johnson's ouster, telling NBC News earlier today that he asked Johnson to resign. You want him to resign? Yes. Yeah, I asked him to resign. And what did he say? He said he would not. And then I said, well, you're the one who's going to put us into this. Because the motion is going to get called, okay? Does anybody doubt that? The motion will get called. And then he's going to lose more votes than Kevin McCarthy. And I have told him this in private, like, weeks ago. 
Massey's opposition complicates the math for Speaker Johnson. If the motion to oust him goes forward, especially with another Republican set to resign from Congress this Friday, which would all but ensure Johnson would need to appeal to Democrats to keep his job. Boy, this is going to be some interesting drama to watch. Joining me now on set is Democratic strategist Amisha Cross, Republican strategist Doug High, and Reuters White House correspondent, my friend. We go back to college together, Thank Medill you. School of Journalism. Yeah, Jeff Mason, Jeff, good to have you here. I, I want to ask you, as, as the friend, so you get the first rights on this, how big is this task for Speaker Johnson right now? Literally, he has almost no margin to play with on this issue. And this is, as it relates specifically to these separate funding bills, this is a quick way to upset a lot of people in one swing. It is. And what's interesting is that he may be uniting some Democrats because of that. It's got to be such a thorn in his side right now. This is somebody who probably never really ever thought he was going to become Speaker of the House, got the job after a zillion other people weren't able to get the job because they couldn't get enough votes. And now it probably also sees the politics of it as not only being bad for him because he wants to have the job, but it's bad for his caucus and bad for his, his team, as it were. And he kind of made that point by saying it's better for Republicans if I'm in charge and if we're here, and it's better for the country, which of course is his position. But man, what a blow. Well, let me ask, I mean, Doug, to you specifically, this relate. this is not just about the House Republican Conference, it's about Donald Trump, the head of the party right now, right? And it just reminds you of what we saw with Kevin McCarthy not too long ago. That was three weeks of madness. It was a total mess, and the party really feels like it can't afford this again, can they? No, it, well, it depends on who you talk to within the party. Look, this is, this is the result of having a very slim majority um, where parts of that majority are incentivized to go against themselves. And so it speaks to why Speaker Johnson went down to Mar-a-Lago um, to see Trump. He wants his support and needs his support because if there's any splintering, one of two things happens. Either Johnson's out or he depends on Democrats to get those votes to save him. Neither one of those is a good situation for House Republicans. And I think the thing that Republicans should remember is it's this old phrase in politics, if, you know, if, not, if not this person, then who? We learned in the last one, well, it's not you, it's not you, it's not you. Who's the then who right there, now? There is no then who. And this is why these, this is why these conference meetings, ultimately, are Republicans grabbing their own fists and saying, stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself. We see this time and time again. And you know it's bad for House Republicans when they have more than one conference meeting in a week. We've had a lot of weeks like this. We yeah. could have that again this week. Okay, let me ask you, Misha, if I can really quickly about this Massey news in particular. This was a pretty dramatic scene that likely played out behind closed doors. There was said to be a lot of jawing going on back there, as, as I imagine Doug has seen in the past. What are Democrats to do in this moment? Should they save his job? You've heard from Swazi from New York. You've heard from, who else, uh, Moskowitz from Florida saying that they would help do that if necessary. Is that the right strategy for these Democrats? No, I think the Democrats should let them burn their own house down. Um, at this point, the Republicans have shown that they are more in tune and aligned with what Trump wants them to do, these late night calls that he's making. In addition to that, pushing with the furthest end of the, the MAGA wing and allowing Marjorie Taylor Greene and a small group of others to basically drag them down, irrespective to the fact that this is going to really hurt in the down ballot races. This just opens up more of an opportunity for a House Speaker um, Jeffries more than anything else. Well, let me ask you, though, you say that you should let, they should, the Democrats should let the Republicans burn their house down. But isn't there some wider responsibility here for the House Democrats, right? Isn't the better strategy, perhaps, to say, hey, we got to get aid to Ukraine done. We got to get aid to Israel done. So rather than let the Republicans do this to themselves, let's help the country and let's help the world by doing something not when that you benefits have, them on an aid pack. Not when you have the House Republicans who also just introduced articles of impeachment for Mayorkas. They are clearly not here to play ball for the American people. They are here for sham impeachments. They are here not understanding that the math isn't mapping. They cannot get the things that they want because they don't have those numbers in mm -hmm. the House. And they are here to play a game that the American public is not asking them to play and one that does not benefit their voters. I'm going to steal that. The math isn't mathing. Jeff, go ahead. All <laughs> very, very good political points, but there's another piece to that is that the White House has things that it wants to get. And I, I they're being very careful and perhaps we could say cagey about not giving a position on whether Democrats should President help. Biden just spoke to Speaker Johnson the last 24 hours. Indeed. And, but they haven't said we want Democrats to, to bail them out. But John Kirby, the spokesman said today, the NSC spokesman said today on Air Force One that Speaker Johnson's plan does appear to be a way to get funding for Ukraine and for Israel. Mm -hmm. Still want some more details, but he left that door pretty wide open, which I thought was telling. Yeah, And, and the, other, the other option then is if none of that works, um, and Republicans aren't able to get this through, then do you see Republicans sign a Democratic discharge petition? 
And if that happens, the House also then, because there are no real great scenarios here, potentially turns into chaos as well. There really are not a lot of great answers. And it com comes down to, as Amisha talked about, electoral politics. If we had won five more seats, eight more seats like we thought we might have, different result. I think it's very telling that Republican governors are calling this out. The governor of uh, Georgia called it out earlier and spoke to the fact that this is going to be a disaster for the Republican Party. I think that they also should pay attention to governors and battlegrounds who are trying to, again, size up their down ballot races. This is not a good thing for Republicans and it's not a good thing for America. Yeah, Brian Kemp, who's, whose name could be at the top of a presidential ticket in a post-Trump era where there'd be such a thing. I want to talk about the discharge position quickly for people trying to make sense of that right now. That basically means going to what the Senate plan was to work on that mm -hmm. supplemental bill and not to try to do it independently. We'll see whether that plays out. Let me ask you, Amisha, about the split screen that we're watching. Pennsylvania, you got the trial versus the trail, as we like to cutely describe it, right? <laughs> you got President Biden on the road talking the economy. You got Donald Trump behind closed doors in a courtroom where most of we see what we see of him is a quick sketch and a couple stills to go with it. Should President Biden be leaning in on this contrast or focus exclusively on the economy as he's largely done? He should focus exclusively on the economy and he should do it because that is what has polling has shown that the American people care about the most. Um, leaning in into these cases only feeds into the rhetoric that the Trump campaign continues to use, um, specifically that this is the Biden weaponized uh, criminal justice system. He needs to focus on where Americans are, and the majority of Americans care about the rising electric costs, they care about their utility bills, they care about not being able to afford groceries, they care about housing costs. Be in that lane and showcase how your policies and plans help them. Doug, the courtroom was a pretty good backdrop during the primary season for former president. President Trump. He used it to help elevate his fundraising, yeah. right? He used it to help get his message across day in, day out. That was the primary. This is the general. Can he do the same thing with it this go around? Potentially so. You know, he's not necessarily Who's on the there road. left to convince right now? If you think that he was mistreated, haven't you already decided you support Donald Trump? Well, there are still voters who don't like Donald Trump and don't like Joe Biden. And if Donald Trump is able to be in the airwaves all day, every day, um, where, you know, Joe Biden's going to particular places, especially during weekdays when Donald Trump can't. But Donald Trump is on everybody's TV screen every day. Um, so he does feel that maximum media exposure, blunt force trauma of that benefits him. We'll have to see if it works or not. But I think it's why Biden would be smart to stay out of this. Biden emphasizes Trump's legal difficulties, eth ethical difficulties by not having that. You know, I go back to the Abigail Spanberger race um, in, the, in the midterms. Virginia where she basically would run ads that says, I'm a hardworking member of Congress and I have town halls. Okay, who cares? Well, ultimately what she was saying is, and by contrast, my opponent is an insane person. She didn't have to say the opponent was a sane person. She said, I'm competent and I do my job. If Biden can do that and get his numbers up with the economy, then he's in a much stronger position. Jeff, last thought, by the end of the week, the president and vice president combined will have spent eight days already this year in Pennsylvania. Yeah, it's, it's probably the most important state and he's going to keep going. And the, the one thing I would add that maybe ties it all together is Biden's polls are going up. And uh, President, former President Trump's polls are going down a little bit. It's April. Every, everything can change in the next weeks and months. But um, it's changing a little bit right now to the benefit of the president. Yeah, well, we've got a long way to go. As we I do. At this table now. Appreciate you all being here. Thank Doug, you. nice to see you, Jeff. You Amisha, nice to see you in person. Thanks Thank for joining you. us today as well. Still ahead right here inside Gaza's dire humanitarian crisis, we are joined by a leader of a relief organization organization who was just on the ground inside Gaza, what he says must be done now to get aid to people who need it the most. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Three days after an Iranian attack was mostly thwarted by Israel and its allies, including the U.S., it appears to be less a matter of if Israel will respond, but how and when. U.S. officials tell NBC News they do expect a possible response to be limited in scope to involve strikes against Iranian military forces as well as Iran-backed proxies in that region. That assessment was based on conversations before Saturday's drone and missile attack. And it comes as world leaders, including President Biden, are urging Israel to exercise restraint. While Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu faces global scrutiny for the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Look at the pictures from there. Yesterday, the White House said more than 2,000 trucks have entered the territory in the last week or so. The aid has incre uh, increased, and quite dramatically, in, in just the last few days, more than 2,000 trucks have been able to get in. I think I'm, I might be uh, wrong on this number, but I think it's nearly 100 or so over the last 24 hours alone. Uh, so the aid is getting in. Uh, that's important, but it has to be sustained. 
It comes after United Nations officials said that Israel denied aid missions to northern Gaza. The head of USAID, Samantha Powers, testified before Congress last week that famine was already setting in. Meanwhile, thousands of displaced Palestinians remain in limbo with the U.S. with the Israeli military warning people to stay away from the north as the Israeli Minister of Defense signals measures are being taken in preparation for an invasion of Rafah in the south. Joining me now is Bob Kitchen, Vice President for Emergencies at the International Rescue Committee, who just spent three days on the ground in Gaza. Bob, it's nice to see you in person. I'm glad you're back here uh, home safely right now. We've been hearing from the White House that there is much more aid now arriving into Gaza over the course of the last week and a half or so. Obviously, the White House concedes it's not enough still. But does that match your experience? Were you seeing more aid arriving in Gaza when you were there? I saw some more aid come in. It seems that the Israelis have switched on the system a little more to let aid in. But to be honest, it's not getting to the people that it needs to. The Israelis still control the de-confliction system, which allows aid workers and the UN to move around in Gaza, and they're not giving the permissions. So the aid is stuck in warehouses at the moment. So fundamentally, that's the key. What are those obstacles? It's the Israelis, you're saying, right it's now, that the, basically aren't letting it get to its final destination. It's the deconfliction system, the approval system that we require to be able to move around, which is constraining the distribution of aid. So the IRC has called for an immediate and a sustained ceasefire right now. But beyond that, what else does your organization need? What does it want to see happen immediately to help try to better resolve this awful crisis? Well, it starts with a ceasefire. We need approvals to move around, but we also need the airstrikes to stop. The drones flying above my head for the three days that I was there, I've never experienced before. It's terrifying, that constant buzzing noise. That has to stop. People need to stop being killed and injured. We then have to have the freedom of movement that we require, and by law we should enjoy, to distribute aid. You were saying before that there's been an increase. It needs to be a tenfold increase to catch up with the needs that we see. Uh, close to a million people on the brink of famine. It's going to take a sustained, huge uplift in aid to, to, just to catch up. And to be clear, the, the concern is not exclusively the risk of famine. It's also the risk of disease, given the circumstances, the conditions under which people are living uh, in right now. Obviously, medical supplies are as dire in terms of their need as is the food and other humanitarian aid there. I mean, it's an explosive situation in so many different ways. People don't actually die of hunger when they die, die through famine. They die of dehydration, Lack the of system care. closing down, and the piles of trash that are mounting in the streets because they're not being collected, the overflowing sewage. I have this image of two little girls playing in a river of human sewage mm. in my mind. That is what people gives people cholera. That's what people die of when they're so hungry. So we require the ability to collect trash, to solve the sewer, to safely operate on the many people who are being injured, to get into the primary health care. Everything is needed, and it starts with the fighting stopping. We were talking before you walked into the studio. I've been to Gaza more than a decade ago. Obviously, the circumstances then, though tough, were not anything like we're witnessing right now. Beyond that scene you described of those two young girls playing in that river of waste, what, what images, what's stuck with you? What still sort of haunts you? Or what images do you want folks to recognize that you witnessed? Well, I think the thing that has stuck with me, I went in expecting security, the ever-present risk to be the determining factor of my trip. What it actually was with people coming to tell me, trying to explain what was happening, the violence that they'd seen, the displacement that they'd seen, because they think the outside world doesn't know. Mm. Because how could the outside world not act not intervene to stop the violence if they knew. If this they was knew. How can I tell them? Everyone knows we're just not acting. That's what stuck with me. That, that, that's dramatic. I can only ima imagine the experience you had. How, how do you and how does your organization reach those without a permanent home right now? The, the system, as you note, is not in place. There isn't the, the drop-off, the delivery points. How does that work? Well, Rafa the border town where there is now 1.4 million people. The people are everywhere. So organizing distribution points, delivering water, cleaning up trash, it is quite straightforward because there's so many people around us. Our primary project is, is sending surgeons in, yeah. emergency medical teams who are working around the clock to serve people who have seen 
terrible injuries. The doctor was telling me the previous night she had treated a seven-year-old girl who had come in with a, a, a gunshot to her head. Mm. And our doctor didn't know whether it was an IDF sniper or a quadcopter, a drone that had shot this little girl. Can I ask you about the la last thing I want to get to is the World Central Kitchen, the awful, awful experience that we saw where seven of their staffers were killed only a couple of weeks ago. After the call with President Biden, President Biden had pushed the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to do better in terms of deconfliction and make sure you're protecting those aid workers there. Did you notice anything different taking place in the course of the last couple of weeks that the Israelis are doing to try to better secure the arrival of that aid and to protect those aid workers delivering it? Well, I'll say a couple of things. Number one, I drove past the World Central Kitchen cars that are still on the side of the road. So mm -hmm. Aid is still being delivered, nevertheless. I would say that World Central Kitchen is the most serious example, but five other organisations, including the IRC, has been attacked. So it is an ongoing problem. Bob Kitchen, I appreciate your making time to speak to us. Thank you. We're glad again that you're home safe. Thank you. Coming up, the Supreme Court questions if the government went too far when it charged hundreds of people, including the former president, with obstruction tied to the January 6th attack on the Capitol. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. The Supreme Court today heard a case that could impact hundreds of January 6th defendants. The case was brought by a January 6th defendant himself who's trying to dismiss a charge accusing him of obstructing an official proceeding. Some of the court's conservative justices questioned the government's use of the statute in its prosecutions, suggesting the Department of Justice relied on an overly broad interpretation of the law. The results of this case could have an effect on Donald Trump as well as he faces charges of violating that same law in special counsel Jack Smith's election interference case against him. And joining me now to help break down this case and its possible implications is NBC News Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delaney. And Ken, good to see you in person. So what did we hear specifically today? Did the justices give us any sense of which way they may be leaning here? They did, Peter. At issue here is whether this uh, law only applies to people who destroy documents documents or whether it can apply more broadly to the kind of violent uh, obstruction we saw at the Capitol. And a majority of justices appeared to have questions about how it's being applied. They thought that it should be applied more narrowly. And a lot of these arguments, they were very technical, hinging on statutory uh, you know, interpretations. But the, the real world concern that some of the conservatives had is, wait a second, does this apply to protesters? If somebody stood up in this court and disrupted our proceeding, could they get 20 years in prison? Mm. They were raising that prospect, and the uh, Solicitor General didn't seem to have great answers for that. How soon could we expect a ruling on this? And I guess ultimately, what would either ruling mean for these January 6th defendants? It's possible if they go all the way uh, that they could knock out these charges which have been levied against more than 350 people in the January 6th matter. And of course, two of the four charges against Donald Trump uh, involve this particular statute. That wouldn't kill the case against Mr. Trump, but it would wound it severely. So yeah, help me better understand how this plays in to the Trump case here. Could this, you say, it could wound it severely. So there is certainly a tie-in directly to this, yeah. but it wouldn't be in and of itself it wouldn't be enough. Well, there's two things. There's also an argument that even if they decided only applies to document destruction, it could still apply to Mr. Trump because of the false elector scheme right. involving fake documents. But let's say that doesn't happen. There are still two other charges against Mr. Trump that are unrelated to this statute. What does this tell us broadly about the way the Supreme Court kind of views the January 6th attack right now? We're still waiting for the court to weigh in on the issue of immunity yeah. for the former president as well? Honestly, not much. They, they, many of the justices talked about how serious and, and destructive the attack on the, on the Capitol was. This was really about um, the language of the statute and whether it was overly broadly interpreted by the Justice Department. Last thing, Justice Clarence Thomas, he wasn't there yesterday. He was back on the bench today. Do we know what was up and why he was We away? heard not a thing about that. No transparency whatsoever from the Supreme Court on that count. Yeah, I was going to say, no transparency, Supreme Court? Wow. <laughs> That's the way it is on a lot of things these days, I trust. Ken, nice to see you. Thanks you for too. your expertise and perspective on this stuff. And as we like to say around here, if it's Tuesday, voters are voting somewhere. And today, that somewhere is the state of Michigan, where control of the state house is at stake. Voters 
are heading out to the polls in a pair of state House special elections. Both those seats are empty after the Democrats holding them resigned to become mayors. Both seats lean Democratic right now. The Michigan State House is deadlocked. Get this, 54-54 is the current tie in the chamber. If the Democrats win both special elections today, they will regain control of the State House. It would also restore the party's trifecta of power in the battleground state with control of the House, the Senate, and the governor's mansion. We'll be watching those results as they come in. That is going to do it for us this hour. We're back with more Meet the Press now tomorrow. NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.